Hello, this is Mark Tooley, editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy, as well as president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy. And I have the pleasure today of talking to uh, Dr. Will Inboden, who directs the um, Clement Center for National Security at the University of Texas uh, in Austin, and uh, has written an important article for Providence that will run later this week on Christian ethics and nuclear weapons along with the two uh, equally distinguished uh, co-authors. So, Will, really appreciate your joining us for this conversation. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here. Well, to set the uh, stage, of course, uh, Christian churches have been discussing the ethics of nuclear weapons for the last uh, 70 years, but there's been some acceleration in the more negative stance towards nuclear deterrence, with Pope Francis effectively saying the possession of nuclear weapons is uh, morally unacceptable. And here in the U.S., the National Association of Evangelicals in recent years has also um, denounced the possession of nuclear weapons. So, uh, Will, give us a little bit of your own background. You're having served, of course, on the national security staff of uh, President George W. Bush's administration. And you're also a very a serious uh, Christian thinker. So uh, you're addressing this topic is very helpful. So, well, thank you, Mark. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a topic that's been of uh, long time I interest for me, going back to you know the very beginnings of both my academic and policy careers. As a scholar, I've studied the uh, the history of Christian voices trying to shape American foreign policy in the Cold War and the more recent present. And of course, uh, debate nuclear debates have certainly been uh, a big part of that. Uh, and then as a, a sometime policymaker working on overall American strategy towards um, our, our different uh, adversaries and, and threats in the world, uh, you know, nuclear weapons and our nuclear arsenal is an important part of those discussions as well. And so I, I wear a couple of hats in, in bringing this. Uh, of course, all uh, the transcendent factor being my, my own Christian faith. Your article uh, recalls that um the man who is sort of the patron saint of Providence, Reinhold Niebuhr, effectively uh, endorsed uh, nuclear deterrence, although uh, he didn't necessarily follow uh, the just war tradition. Uh, and you also uh, reference uh, Paul Ramsey, who mm -hmm. essentially rediscovered the just war tradition for American uh, Protestants in the late uh, 20th century. How do you uh, fit the just war tradition in with possession of nuclear weapons? So, yeah, and here's where, uh, I, uh, to draw some distinctions, I v very much identify myself as, as a Niebuhrian and have, you know, written quite a bit about that. And, and of course, that's where you and I certainly share an affinity for, for Reinhold Niebuhr is really one of our most trenchant uh, Christian thinkers on uh, the role of Christianity in, in, in foreign policy, uh, questions of the use of force in a, in a fallen and unjust world. I say that by way of preface that I actually uh, part ways somewhat with Niebuhr on his approach to thinking about nukes and identify myself more with Paul Ramsey and some of his correction there. And, and of course, James Turner Johnson has done some wonderful thinking and, and research on this. I've got to give him a lot of credit and say that his work has uh, influenced some of my own, own thinking too. Uh, but I think the key distinction is for Niebuhr, uh, nuclear weapons were a necessary evil in, in a fallen world. Uh, and he was somewhat uh, skeptical about uh, whether the Christian ethic of love of neighbor could even apply. It was rather more that, uh, you know, he would often use the phrase dirty hands, that we need to have dirty hands in this messy fallen world. And sometimes that means doing really brutal things in, in warfare. Um, and this is why, uh, even though overall Niebuhr was a defender of nuclear deterrence, there's not always a lot of consistency in his thought. You know, at times he seemed to endorse the dropping of the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and he later had some um, uh, mis misgivings about that. Uh, in the 50s, he would endorse the American nuclear buildup, but by the 60s became more more, more skeptical. Whereas uh, Paul Ramsey, uh, grounds nuclear deterrence in the ethic of neighbor love and our obligations, to, in particular, to our to our weaker neighbors. And so he ha had channels uh, more of an Augustinian frame here and really locates it in the just war tradition of the use of force uh, can be part of our obligations of loving our neighbors. Um, and that, in turn, enabled 
Ramsey, I think, to embed nuclear weapons in a more ethical framework, where he was always very clear that it is wrong to use nuclear weapons directly targeting civilian populations. Um, he would make some allowances if there were uh, incidental civilian deaths, um, but uh, he was just as he was in some ways a nuclear hawk that we need nuclear deterrence against you know the evils of the Soviet threat and others. He was also one who wanted to uh, restrain the the use of nukes uh, so that they are only going against legitimate military targets. The details in that, of course, can be messy, but I think that's a really important framework that he had uh, grounded in this ethic of, of neighbor love. And so that's where I want to, that's where we try to uh, identify ourselves in this, in this article. From uh, my vantage point, and tell me if you agree or not, uh, this growing um, Christian opposition to nuclear weapons is very much in sync with uh, at least a growing uh, Christian, at least soft pacifism, which mm -hmm. seems implicitly to reject uh, any sort of um, violence without necessarily self-identifying as pacifist per se. And it really contrasts with, for example, uh, the Catholic Bishop's uh, declaration on nuclear weapons back in the 1980s, which was problematic, but it was not pacifist. And in fact, uh, it urged uh, a drawdown of nuclear weapons and essentially replacing them with additional conventional forces in Western um, Europe. But uh, do you see this drift towards uh, a soft pacifism very much present among uh, Christian intellectuals uh, of today? I, I, I do see it. And again, obviously, there's quite a bit of diversity within Christian intellectual thought, you know, both ca uh, Protestant and, and Catholic. But um, some of the overall trends over the last uh, 10 to 20 years, I think, have been have been worrisome with some of that soft pacifism. I think um, anytime we're looking at a body of Christian intellectual thought, it needs to be situated in the broader context of what's going on in the world. And some of this comes from, I think, some understandable exhaustion and frustration with uh, the, the length of the Afghanistan and Iraq wars and you know, the unsatisfying outcomes there, to, to, to put it mildly. Um, as well as just some of the broader frishers we're seeing within, 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 within Christendom. Um, uh, but meanwhile, uh, we now have this growing threat from you know, great powers, uh, peer competitors like Russia and China. Russia still has the world's largest nuclear arsenal, um, and China has a growing arsenal. Uh, we don't know the details on that because China's rather uh, opaque with it. Um, but uh, insofar as the United States is confronting uh, some malevolent authoritarian powers here, uh, you know, it's it's I think a regrettable but sure fact that we need to uh, we, we need to maintain an effective nuclear arsenal uh, precisely because we do want to deter deter war with them. And so uh, part of what our article is doing is you know encouraging our fellow Christians to uh, to bring our thinking and concern up to date with um, the present geopolitical moment. And that's where Niebuhr always is a, a reliable lodestar. When you look at the evolutions in Niebuhr's thoughts uh, over his career, it's very much in relation to world events. And so trying to hold on to certain timeless principles while also adapting it to whatever the, the current geopolitical moment and the current threats are. In Niebuhr's case, whether it's Nazi Germany in the 30s and 40s or the Soviet Union in the 40s and 50s. Your article uh, mentions a... Um a statement uh, some years ago uh, calling for nuclear disarmament endorsed by um, such senior figures as uh, Henry Kissinger, George Shultz, mm -hmm. uh, former Defense uh, Secretary uh, Perry, and former Senator uh, Sam Nunn. And uh, George Shultz uh, collaborated with the National Association of Evangelicals uh, on their anti-nuclear statement. It's a little surprising to see these uh, senior uh, persons uh, endorse such a declaration. Was their intent more visionary than uh, practical? Or what is your interpretation? Well, I, yeah, I first want to say I, I have, uh, you know, tremendous respect uh, for, for those four statesmen, uh, you know, and, and a personal angle too. My first boss in my early policy career was Sam Nunn. I worked for him for two years in the, in the Senate back in the 1990s and continue to just think the world of him as a, as a statesman and a Christian. And likewise, as I'm writing this book on President Reagan's foreign policy, George Schultz is a towering figure there. Uh, and I've interviewed him for it and, uh, you know, and, and think he's really in, in, in American treasure. Uh, similarly, Kissinger and Bill Perry, you, know, you won't find more distinguished careers than that. And so uh, anytime one is going to be taking a position that differs from uh, lodestars such as, such as those, those four, we need to do it with some, some, some fear and trembling. Uh, but I would, I would just say that um, 
uh, you know, come back to my, my earlier points, uh, and we elaborate on this in the article, that uh, one, I think, first needs to look at the threats in the world and what our adversaries are doing, uh, and then ask what are the, the proper means to deter and counter that. So uh, I personally don't like nuclear weapons. I wish that we were able to live in a world without nuclear weapons, and so I can endorse that as an ultimate goal, uh, just as you know that was one of President Reagan's ultimate goals. But the sequencing is really, really important. Uh, and I don't think we can get to that goal by, I, I don't think we can or should get to that goal by unilateral disarmament. Um, uh, while our adversaries still uh, still have such weapons and seek to seek to do us harm, um, so rather I think it's about first addressing the threat from these adversaries, and then if that is eventually gone, then maybe we can start to talk about um, you know significant reductions in, in in nuclear arsenals. But this was part of the genius of Reagan's strategy towards towards the Soviet Union, and you know Schultz was a key was a key implementer of that. Um, but I just don't think it's realistic or responsible be, to be talking now about abolishing nuclear weapons, especially with these growing threats. There are, of course, there have always been uh, conservatives who are skeptical of the whole concept of uh, arms control, mm -hmm. uh, but you would not be in that school of thought. And uh, so I assume that you would agree that uh, Christian realists uh, can endorse uh, a certain level of arms control without turning it into a uh, uh, utopian preoccupation. Yeah, exactly. It's about means and ends. And I think arms control in, in a number of contexts can be an important means to a, a safer world and to reduce threats from our adversaries. Uh, but the problem is sometimes there can be, to be a little uh, you know, colloquial about this, this cult of arms control that treats arms control as this idyllic end in and of itself that should be uh, pursued irrespective of uh, the the much more nefarious designs of some some adversary adversary states. Um, so, uh, you know, with, to get more specific, as we talk about in the article, with discussions about the American withdrawal from the INF Treaty. Look, I had great admiration for the INF Treaty. Uh, President Reagan is one of President Reagan's signature uh, accomplishments, but he was always uh, very concerned about Soviet cheating on past arms control treaties and. You know, now that it's very clear that the Russians have engaged in serial, ongoing, deliberate violations of the INF Treaty, it was tying our hands uh, without limiting the, the Soviets sufficiently. Meanwhile, intermediate-range nuclear missiles are um, the backbone of the Chinese uh, nuclear arsenal, and that treaty was also a real constraint on American efforts to deter Chinese aggression in, in the Asia Pacific. And so that would be an example of, in the context of the Cold War and Reagan's 1987 agreement, I, I certainly would have you know, uh, supported it, um, but it's, it's a new moment now, and that treaty had outlived its, its usefulness. Same with uh, New START. Um, there are good arguments to be made on, on either side. My co-authors and I actually have our own different opinions on this, which is why we don't take one, but um, uh, with the ongoing, uh, certainly growing frictions in the U.S.-Russia relationship, um, I would not want uh, to see New START uh, being a, a, a place where we're making unnecessary concessions to the Russians uh, or trying to use that treaty as a way to preserve what is a, uh, a deteriorating relationship. Uh, whereas uh, if there comes a time when um, you know, pursuing arms control could be done in the context of overall improvements in the U.S.-Russia relationship, I would I would certainly be more be more supportive. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the big takeaway is it's not so much about the arms control; it's about uh, the main priority is looking at what are the threats facing our country and what is the nature of those uh, the relationships we have with the, with those with those different countries, and then putting arms control in that in that proper context. As you reference uh, in your article, uh, opponents of nuclear weapons, uh, Christian or otherwise. Uh, typically uh, focus on the evils of the weapons themselves, but very rarely uh, examine uh, the nature of the regimes or compare the nature of the regimes that have the weapons and leaving uh, or implying that uh, French nuclear weapons are as threatening as uh, nuclear weapons uh, possessed by North Korea or potentially by um, Iran. If you could uh, discuss that a little bit. True. Yeah, it, we, we brought this point out in an effort to um, kind of show, you know, uh, most Americans, that m most Americans have an intuitive sense of being able to distinguish between these. Um, yes, you know, nuclear weapons themselves are, you know, can, can be terrifying. I mean, I grew up in Tucson, Arizona in the 70s and 80s when um, the Titan missile uh, silos surrounded the, the city. And so we were under, you know, uh, uh, constant threat of a Soviet nuclear attack, and it was absolutely terrifying, right? So these are um, uh, 
you know, really destructive, destructive weapons. Um, however, uh, what matters most is who has them, not their, not their very existence. Uh, and that's why we tried to make the point that, you know, I, I never lost sleep growing up knowing that the British had nuclear weapons. Um, I don't have much concern about um, reports that Israel may have a, a, a nuclear arsenal. Obviously, that, you know, that is not, not fully acknowledged um, because those are democratic nations who are allies of the United States um, and, and don't wish us any, any harm. Uh, whereas the thought of an Iranian nuclear weapon or the fact that the North Koreans have them or the fact that China has them uh, is much more worrisome because it's the nature of the regime. These are, you know, malevolent actors who, uh, who wish, uh, wish ill towards the United States and, uh, and towards a lot of our, our, our fellow, fellow democracies. So that's the context that we hope uh, discussions about the details of arms control in America's nuclear arsenal can, can take place. Well, uh, if we could conclude uh, by getting a little bit personal with you, uh, in that you come from a strongly uh, Christian uh, background. Uh, mm -hmm. At any point, was it ever difficult to mesh your faith uh, with your vocation to work in the field of uh, national security studies, or were they uh, mutually reinforcing? So that's a great question, Mark. Um, I, there, uh, it, it, it certainly is a, is, a, is a complex topic. I mean, my, my faith is in the most important part of, of, of my identity, both as a, as a scholar and as a you know, some, sometime practitioner in this field. Um, there, were, there were tensions, our tensions, all, all the time. Um, it, and it can relate to at, at the intellectual level of, uh, how, you know, trusting in God's good eternal purposes while knowing that, uh, you know, his, his people here on earth are called to uh, make hard decisions with imperfect information and our own sinful fallibility, right? There's that. Um, sometimes it could come down to questions of personal conduct. How do I uh, love my neighbors and uh, behave honorably while still having to engage in the rough and tumble of, of politics and the arguments and policy disputes and media leaks and things like that, that, that take place as well. Um, as well as being reminded that uh, while I dearly love my country and I'm about as patriotic and American as you'll find, uh, our ultimate loyalties as Christians are to the, the eternal kingdom uh, and to our fellow brothers and sisters ar around the world and uh, keeping those, distinguish, uh, those distinctions straight while working to advance um, America's national security interests uh, could could also be could also be challenging sometimes. So um, there were certainly no no simple days or no simple recipes on all this. Dr. Will M. Bowden, director of the Clements uh, Center for National Security Studies at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, thank you so much for a stimulating conversation. It was a it was a pleasure to be with you, Mark. Thank you. I enjoyed it.